Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by YCharts. YCharts is a web-based investing research platform that I've been subscribing to for years. In addition to providing overall market data, it offers investors powerful tools like stock and fund screening and charting analysis with Excel integrations. It's actually one of the few sites that calculates both shareholder yield as well as 10-year PE ratios for stocks, two factors that are notoriously hard to find elsewhere. The YCharts platform is fast, easy to use, and comes at a fraction of the price of larger institutional platforms. Plans start at just 200 bucks a month. And if you visit go.ycharts.com forward slash Meb, you can access a free trial. And when you do, you'll receive up to 500 bucks off an annual subscription. That's go.ycharts.com forward slash Meb. Hey, podcast listeners, happy summertime episode. Today we have a special guest, but before we get to our guest, I wanted to tell you all a reminder. We just had a new book drop this week. It's called The Best Investment Writing, Volume 1. So I can't claim that I wrote it because I was just the editor and compiler, but it contains 32 hand-selected articles by yours truly, some of the best pieces from some of the most respected money managers, investment researchers in the world that were written in 2016. Some highlights include strategies that produce some of the highest historical returns, five due diligence questions to ask before investing, why we often make poor, complex investing decisions, and the easiest and most powerful method to estimate future stock returns. Lots of great authors in there, people we've had on the podcast and some we hope to, people like Jason Zweig, Raoul Powell, Professor Damodaran, Ken Fisher, and even John Malden. So check it out. It's on Amazon. Let me know what you think, and it's good summertime reading. And so now we can transition to the show. Uh, I can't wait to chat with our guest because he's, he's pretty quanty uh, like your host. He's from Blue Sky Asset Management. David Verratti, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks a lot, man. Glad to be here. So David's calling in from Canada. He's the director of research and also a portfolio manager. And I know he's even used to work with some of our friends we've had on the show, the Butler, Philbrick, Gordillo crew from Resolve. Why don't you give us just a, a quick overview of your background for those who aren't familiar, and then we can cannonball into the, the quant pool uh, after that? Sure. Thanks a lot, Meb. Uh, just, yeah, just a bit of my background. I originally started uh, as an investment advisor many, many years ago at uh, RBC Dominion Securities, uh, which is Royal Bank of Canada here uh, up in Toronto. And then I transitioned uh, to uh, doing consulting for, for asset managers. Uh, I launched the CSS Analytics blog, started doing some consulting for asset managers, uh, hedge fund managers, developing trading strategies. You know, sort of got to be known as a, as a geeky quant. Uh, from there, I you know got to know a bunch of people in the industry, ended up uh, going to work for uh, Butler, Philbrook, and Gordillo, uh, now Resolve Asset Management, a bunch of great guys uh, here in Toronto, and I uh, helped them out with uh, you know, designing uh, various uh, asset allocation uh, algorithms and strategies. And uh, from there, I moved to Flexible Plan Investments, uh, which is based in Michigan, which uh, manages a ton of different strategies, services advisors, got to know uh, a lot about that business as well. And then I uh, joined uh, Blue Sky Asset Management. In 2014, uh, where we began as a separate account manager, um, and then we transitioned to launching five ETFs as uh, Quantex funds, you know, at the end of uh, January this year. 
Great. And investors listening, these, these funds kind of burst on the scene, uh, you know, from, from a f- new fund company to have five successful funds is pretty rare. And so then encourage you to check those out. But, but we're going to talk a little more about research today. Why don't we get started? I was, you know, kind of perusing the website and a couple comments on there that'll kind of help talk about the framework for how you guys see the world. And then we can get into specifics, but a couple comments, you know, one, you said, you're talking about time frames. You said, unlike endowments, investors don't have an infinite time horizon. For this reason, we believe the traditional strategic asset allocation approach based on modern portfolio theory is suboptimal. And rather, we favor a dynamic approach to asset allocation. We believe a systematic quantitative approach is necessary to avoid emotions and biases in decision making. I mean, I, I love all of that. Why don't, why don't you talk a little bit about y'all's general framework and how you kind of think about the world, and then uh, we can get into a little some more specifics later. Sure, that sounds good. I mean, I think just going back even to my early days uh, in the investment industry, I think one of the perennial problems that I always saw was is that you know it's easy to be a buy and hold investor as long as the market's going up. But when it's going down, it makes it very difficult both for portfolio managers and, and for investors to be able to stay the course. And so, you know, this this problem becomes, you know, magnified if you're close to retirement or you're actually in retirement, you know, both mathematically and psychologically, where, you know, you have a 50% drawdown as you just entered retirement or, or, or if you have a 30, you know, 30% drawdown with a 60-40, I mean, it's absolutely devastating psychologically and and financially. And so, you know, what I came to realize, you know, was is that managing risk, you know, early on in my career was that managing risk is, is absolutely critical. It's critical, you know, mathematically and psychologically. And, and, and it's just, you know, if you, if you look at the history of markets, you know, markets go through a wide variety of different cycles. You know, sometimes you have like the 70s where you have rising interest rates, you have a lot of inflation, you have Situations like the 90s, which is, you know, kind of like a Goldilocks scenario where, you know, inflation's low and the market's rising. You know, you have a situation like the 30s where you have the Great Depression. Uh, just a wide variety of different market scenarios. I mean, 2008 is the most recent example. I mean, and also 2001 to 2002, where you had these, you know, terrible drawdowns in the market. And, you know, you need to be able to adjust and adapt both to, to equity bear markets, but you also need to be able to adjust to uh, to interest rates, and you also need to be able to adjust to uh, to inflation, and so you know all all these factors are are absolutely critical. And so you can have a good strategic a- asset allocation, but it's really designed for the law of averages. And so it's designed to be you know especially if it's well designed to perform in a mix of different conditions, it's designed to perform well on average. But you know that that doesn't necessarily mean for that specific investor. Because, you know, you don't have the luxury of, of, of the law of large numbers on your side. And so, you know, like an endowment that has 30 to 50 years, you, you just can't, you know, your, your, your life can even change substantially during retirement or prior to retirement, you know, whether you have a change in your career or, or things like that. And so if you have a dynamic asset allocation, you have the ability to be more in tune with the market regime that is, that is currently going on. And so if it's, uh, you know, an equity bear market, you have the ability to de-risk your portfolio and hold more fixed income. If if inflation is rising significantly, you have the ability to uh, allocate more to real assets and commodities. You know, and if, you know, equities are doing extremely well and it's a low inflation environment, then you have the ability to increase your equity exposure. And so a dynamic asset allocation isn't perfect, but you know, it allows you to have to, to be more in tune with what's currently going on, and, and it's less dependent, in our opinion, on on the law of large numbers and, and and luck. And so, we like to minimize that factor as much as possible. And so, you guys wrote a great white paper called "Dynamic Asset Allocation." We'll post a link to the show notes. So, tell us what you mean when you say dynamic. You know, is is this mean you guys just you know wake up? once a month and say, Hey, we feel like we need to buy, be dynamic. Is it, what, what are the, what's the kind of framework and rules that, that underpin a lot of the, the systems that you guys put in place to switch from say a, a buy and hold strategic allocation to something that is adaptable? Well, that's a great question. I, I mean, a lot of it goes back to, I guess, the fundamentals, you know, many, many of which, you know, you were a pioneer and, you know, laying out a lot of those fundamentals, which is, you know, taking a look at trends and, and momentum as, 
you know, certainly a centerpiece of, of how you want to start off with a dynamic asset allocation approach. And you want to, you know, take a look at the trend and momentum to determine whether you should be invested at all in a specific asset class. And you should be taking a look at relative momentum across asset classes as a guidepost, you know, to, to which asset class you should emphasize more or less. And so, I mean, broadly, a dynamic asset allocation approach could, could incorporate any type of information to, to change its allocations of function market conditions. Uh, but generally speaking, we tend to emphasize, you know, momentum and trends as, as the centerpiece of that. Uh, and, to, and to some extent, we also take a look at volatility. Okay, and, and talk to me a little bit about that. Let's get a little more specific. So the types of momentum, you know, there's there's really two main types. You, you mentioned there's the kind of cross-sectional or relative strength that people discuss, which is comparing investments to each other. So gold compared to the S&P, etc. There's a time series momentum, which most people refer to as trend. So is something going up or down? And then you mentioned a little bit of volatility. Like, how, how does that all come together? Can you, just from a ten thousand foot view, like, how do you guys think about it? Or is the volatility used in the position sizing? Is it used as a signal? What's how does it kind of all come together for for investors listening? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, generally, we you know, first of all, we start with some type of a strategic a strategic allocation that kind of reflects you know longer term assumptions. Uh, and reflects the, you know, the unique constraints, you know, that, that, that we have running ETFs. You know, we, we use those, that base strategic asset allocation to, to start the dynamic process. And what's an example of that? It would be like, you know, X amount in U.S. stocks and foreign. Do you have any sort of base that you start from or does it depend on the? Sure. It really depends on, on, on the fund. But, you know, is it just as a, you know, general example, if you had 60% in, you know, domestic equities and you had 20% in international equities, you could use the, uh, the other 20% to, uh, to allocate to, to the best performing asset class as an example. You know, what we tend to do is we don't, we don't allow most of the funds to or strategies to completely allocate to, to one individual asset class, but rather to, to vary or, or shade the portfolio towards the better performers. And so that's, that's typically what we would do. And so, you know, you can imagine almost bands around those allocations I gave you as an example, you know, the 60 could move to, you know, to 70 and, you know, the 20 could move to 30. So, so there are a wide variety of ways of, of actually doing that, but that's, that's typically, typically how it's done. And, and you mentioned volatility. How, how, how is that incorporated? Is, is that a signal? Is that a, is that a way to, figure out the position sizing? How do you all think about it? We don't typically use volatility for the position sizing uh, because we, you know, we, you know, we find that, uh, you know, when, when you uh, provide a strategic asset allocation as, as a base, then it's, it's less necessary to do so. And it creates a, you know, a, a lot of turnover and complexity with respect to managing the actual fund. But, you know, in terms of volatility, what we do is, is we use it to determine you know, so if you're looking at time series momentum as an example, you know, most people think it's, it's a binary event. It's either on or off. And so if you're, you know, your absolute return or if the return of the underlying market is greater than cash, then, you know, you're, you're in the market. And if it's lower than cash, then you're out of the market. And we think obviously that's a good, that's a good base. But what we view that is if we take a look at the volatility of the market, we can actually take that and convert it to a probability. And so, you know, what is the probability of outperforming cash? You know, is it, you know, if, if we look at whether cash is outperforming, sorry, the market's outperforming cash, that's a 50% probability. But if it's actually outperforming cash by a larger margin, say two or three or 4%, and volatility respectively happens to be quite low, then that would increase the probability that you would outperform cash. Conversely, if volatility was really high, then the signals that we're getting, you know, could be, you know, quite noisy. And so, you know, you could oscillate around the zero line, so to speak. And so we consider, you know, volatility, you know, to generate our signals to, to minimize transaction costs. And so one of the ways that a lot of people do it is to, to minimize turnover is to use monthly data. And so we want to be as responsive as we can. And so we like to use, you know, daily data where possible 
and instead use volatility and this probability to to better uh, manage turnover. And so what what I mean by that is that we would you know enter when the probability is high that a market's outperforming cash and exit when the probability of cash outperforming that market is is it, high as well. And so how does it kind of all come together? So are you looking at um, this whole portfolio, you know, looking at macro markets? So you got S&P, treasuries, high yield, commodities, all that good stuff. Are you measuring kind of the the, mo- the relative strength across all of each other? Are you uh, kind of looking at them independently? How, how does it kind of end up looking in, in practice? Yeah, in terms of the relative strength as- uh, aspect, um, I was just talking about the uh, sort of uh, risk management or absolute momentum type aspect of things. But in terms of the relative aspect, you know, we like to look at other markets to determine what the return is for an underlying security. So, for example, I mean, you could use the, the, the bigger markets such as the S&P and high yield and commodities and treasury markets to define what the return is for any individual market. So, for example, uh, you know, real estate might be uh, some combination of the return of potentially the commodity market, potentially uh, treasury market, as well as um, exposure to to equities. And so it's it's kind of a hybrid asset class. And so a lot of asset classes have hybrid characteristics. You know, we use those multiple markets to help, you know, just reduce the noise in estimating what the actual return happens to be. And so, how's the world look to you guys right now? I assume the positioning we're in a romping, stop, stomping equities bull market, and, and foreigns catching up. Is it is it something that the dynamic allocation is mostly equity exposed? What's the what's the kind of the strategies positioning sort of as we speak, summer of twenty seventeen? Yeah, I would say most of the strategies are, are are highly exposed to equities and and have been. I mean, to the extent that. You know, different, different strategies have different degrees of diversification. Uh, so different strategic al- asset allocation, so to speak. But generally speaking, the dynamic tilt is, is generally towards equities. And in terms of the risk on indicator or probability of outperforming cash, I mean, generally speaking, that tends to be high across the board. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, markets are definitely, uh, going upwards and volatility is obviously quite low right now. And, and for so someone, you know, we, we recently had William Bernstein on the podcast and I was laughing because I said, Dr. Bernstein, what, what percentage of investors do you think can implement their portfolio on their own? He said, I estimate 99% cannot for various reasons, you know, emotional challenges as, as well as, as, as others. But you've been implementing these strategies for a while both for clients and I'm, I'm sure individually, like what sort of practical challenges does an individual face trying to follow this style? Is this something you say, look, just forget it, just outsource it? Or, you know, what, what are some of the best ways to meet some of those challenges? I mean, it's a, it, I think it's a fantastic question because I think, you know, what I've seen uh, at, at a wide variety of firms in terms of, you know, whether it's advisors or individual clients and how they respond to different strategies you know, one, one of the biggest challenges is, is tracking error. And I think that, you know, the more active and, you know, so-called tactical you are, dynamic, you know, the more tracking error you're going to have. And so that tracking error will be a function of the underlying asset classes that you have in your universe. And it's also a function of how frequently you trade. Higher tracking error, high, you know, if you're, if you're holding 100% of your fund in commodities, as an example, you're obviously not going to look like the the S and P 500, and so you know if that happens to be what you think is the best performer, you know if you rotate you know rapidly between emerging markets and uh, high yield, I mean same difference. And so the the underlying universe that you have and the degree to which you're dynamic will influence this tracking error and will make it difficult for investors that are really uh, focused on conventional indices. And the other factor is, is that when you're managing risk, I mean, managing risk on a dynamic basis is, is really a way of manufacturing cheap insurance. And that's the way that we like to look at it. But, you know, the cost of that insurance is, is the tracking error. And so a lot of times during a bull market, you know, you'll, you'll de-risk and uh, in, uh, invariably you'll end up being market will, will go back up and then you'll get back in. And so, and you'll miss part of that rally. And so, 
you know, that's going to create some tracking or it's going to create some angst for the end investor. And so I think the end investor has to ask himself, what is most important to them? You know, do they want to, you know, reduce the uh, drawdown in a 2008 scenario substantively because that's absolutely critical to them? And, you know, if so, are they willing to take take the tracking error associated with that? That's really the, the balance between those two things. We say, you know, both investment approaches are hard. We've often said that buy and hold is challenging because of the long drawdowns and uh, which often coincide with recessions and, and bad markets in general, but trend following and other types of investment strategies that look so different are hard for another reason. And that's a reason like many probably would have felt in the last couple of years where anything underperforms the S&P 500 and, and just looking different while um, certainly your neighbors and friends are, are getting rich or performing well is is equally as hard as sitting through a drawdown. Um, one of the things your white paper I thought was really cool that I actually I hadn't seen this before. I've seen similarities. It shows a chart of the top 10 money managers with a 20 plus year track record. And six of these were quant trend shops with the top three all being quant trend sort of sort of shops and by the way uh, of the six there's a couple more that are macro which you could probably lump into to, to partially trend too buffett of course is on the table but but is all the way down at number six uh, with these sort of results why isn't every investor familiar with trend and momentum you know why do people love talking about buffett but probably almost no one on this listening to this podcast is could name most of these other traders you know what why why do you what what's what, what's the thought behind that do you have any insight well i guess a couple of things i mean first the fact that you know it's not widely used and not widely known is you know part you know partly why it continues to work i think you know you know the fact that most investors are buying hold i mean it's there, there's no magic i mean i think if if everyone decides that they definitively want to be, uh, you know, to follow momentum and trends, then the uh, profitability or cost of that insurance, like the, the profitability of, of using relative momentum and the cost of insurance, profitability will decline and the cost will go up. But I think that, you know, most people, you know, have a, a passive house, asset allocation. That's certainly one of the reasons why it continues to work. And furthermore, the psychological or behavioral errors also contribute to you know, permitting that to work. But I think it is psychologically difficult to execute. I think that that's, you know, just like, you know, many other factors. I mean, there's no uh, silver bullet in investing. It, everything has its own challenges. I mean, if you want to be a value investor, you know, you'll have years where uh, value will be out of favor. I mean, I think if, you, if you're a trend or momentum investor during certain types of years, you know, sideways type markets especially, you know, you tend to have more challenging situations. You know, I think... The reason why a lot of those investors on that chart um, are there is because, you know, when you stay in tune with what's actually happening in the market, you're much more likely to survive over a long period of time. And so I think that that's, you know, one of the reasons why it continues to be a very effective and durable approach, because you're not saying, well, this is what the market should do while it's doing the opposites. You know, I mean, people like that will eventually just go out of business. It's a great approach, but it's it, it is difficult to stick with. Um, there's a great chart Mike Covell has that compares Dunn Capital, Florida-based CTA, who's had exceptional returns, but you know a lot of volatility as well. But so is Berkshire. But compares it to Berkshire over the years, and it's a really cool chart. I'll see if I can dig it up. But I was laughing as while, while you were talking because I was looking through this chart, and there's a lot of familiar names on here that are pretty famous to to, to investors, but. These guys have made so much money for so long. They've all compounded at 20% or more. And we'll link to a post that the West Gray did on the impossibility of compounding at 20% plus. Basically, the takeaway is you end up owning, you end up becoming one of the richest people on the planet if you can compound at 20% plus for a long time. And that's actually, actually the reality here. I'm looking, so Tudor, he's built a new basketball stadium at my alma mater and owns a ton of conservation land. Then I look down the list, John Henry, he owns a baseball team, the Red Sox. And then uh, Lewis Bacon's More Capital, he owns 
a frigging ski ma- ski mountain. It's actually on my bucket list of places ski Taos, and there's about four others I I could go on. Anyway, it's a fun list. We'll we'll add it to the show notes. But trend followers kind of fly under the radar, but some that have been around for twenty plus years, really spectacular uh, uh, track records. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. There's a term I saw you know, um, on y'all's website and some of the research pieces that mentioned the phrase dynamic beta. And I was wondering if you guys could, could kind of define that or, or talk a little bit about what, what, uh, what that phrase means. Sure. I mean, I think uh, dynamic beta means that, you know, the, uh, just generally speaking, that the, the beta or factor exposure of the underlying portfolio is going to change, you know, just like dynamic asset allocation, dynamic beta you know, is where you hold a, a bunch of stocks and the factor exposure is going to change, you know, frequently as a function of market conditions. So that's what we, you know, look at as a dynamic approach. I mean, you know, more formally, it, you know, means, you know, having some way of, you know, for example, you know, switching between higher and lower beta securities as a function of market conditions and also, you know, determining which stocks you want to hold as a function of what their factor exposure happens to be. I just, I was, in, I was curious because I hadn't seen that before. I like it. There's something you guys do. All right. We're, for those listening, that are in your car or at the gym, you, you may have to, to get off the bike and, and pay attention and hit rewind a few times because we're going to get a little deeper, taking my shovel out, and we're going we're gonna to go down the rabbit hole. You guys talk about using option data, which, which is not something as, as a way to inform portfolios and ideas. Uh, why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Because that's not something we've talked much about here on the podcast. Um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the ideas there? Well, I think the idea was is that, you know, you want to incorporate, I mean, I, I think when you invest in individual securities or individual stocks, you know, there's so many different pieces of information that you can incorporate. You can take a look at fundamentals, you can take a look at technicals. And so, you know, how is it that you're able to capture all of this information? Initially, you know, when, when, I, when, I, when I looked at the problem, I was thinking, okay, well, multi-factor model is probably the solution. And then you you get to thinking that, okay, well, you know, now I have to figure out what I incorporate in that model and how do I make that model dynamic? And so, you know, you start to realize, you know, as a, as a quant that it's a, it's a very difficult problem. And so you start to think, okay, well, where can I get a market-based estimate? You know, something that actually takes all of these things into account and dynamically weighs these things as a function of time and as a function of market conditions. And so start to look at, at option data because option data is forward-looking. And so if you look at implied volatility, you know, you look at the research studies, incorporates all kinds of information in addition to historical volatility. It would incorporate momentum. It incorporates profitability. It incorporates uh, liquidity. Uh, just a whole host of factors began to become very interested in using this as a, as a source to select stocks. And so, you know, what, what, fascinated me was is that the research uh, was relatively robust. And if you look at the research on using options to select stocks, it's a very powerful factor, you know, it seemed to be in an un- undertapped area. You know, what we eventually came upon was to take a look at the um, option market volatility, it, it implied volatility, and segregate it into good and bad volatility. And so good being, you know, for those of you yeah, a, a call option is basically a bet that a stock will go up. And so the implied volatility associated with a call option is, is, is what we refer to as good volatility or upside volatility. And if you look at a put option, that's a bet that something will go down. And put options are what people use to hedge. And we view that as, as bad volatility or downside volatility. And if you look at the differential between those two, then we found that that was the strongest predictor of future stock returns. It incorporated a wide range of information. And the benefit of this was is that you're getting, you know, uh, a market-based estimate of future stock returns that incorporates all these different factors. And so we thought it was kind of an interesting angle. Did you guys come to this? Is this in the academic literature? Is it something you guys kind of, you know, played around with on your own? How did you end up kind of coming around to this? Because it is a little more esoteric. Yeah, it is in the academic literature. It's, it's generally referred to as, as, as implied skew or, or the call put volatility spread. Um, and uh, it is in there and it's been supported by a wide variety of different researchers. Uh, and it's a very robust effect. And, there, you know, there are a lot of things 
on the so-called volatility surface, which is a geeky term for, um, you know, if you lay out all of the call option and put option volatilities at a wide variety of strike price and expirations, you get this, you know, uh, multi-dimensional surface is just really just a big pile of information. You know, how do you extract this information to estimate returns? And so, you know, we looked a lot at the academic research. We did our own research, and then we determined that that was the, uh, you know, the the good versus bad volatility spread was the best predictor of, of future stock returns. And is this something like how often are you guys looking at this? Is is this something that's useful on a quarterly level, monthly, weekly, daily? Like how, how informative is this signal? We look at it monthly, um, and so. Uh, it, it, it's a very informative signal, and you have to balance, uh, you know, turnover and, and and things like that. But I mean, it's generally it's it's one of those signals. It's not like a value signal. It tends to be a shorter term type signal, and so it's going to for, forecast where the stock, you know, which stocks have the highest expected return over the next month or 30 days. Um, it's 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 constantly refreshing itself. And what we found was ver- was very interesting was is that the factor exposure of the stocks that would be selected, you know, tended to be, you know, generally in tune with market conditions. And so, you know, whereas if you use momentum to select stocks in 2009, you tended to hold Johnson and Johnson and very conservative type stocks. You know, if you use the good versus bad volatility spread, you tended to be, you know, holding, you know, the lower quality, lower priced uh, stocks or companies that had huge upside at the bottom of the market in 2009. And that's because the option market is, is essentially predicting that these things have more upside than downside. You know, they're, 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 they have, you know, it's a fancy term for that as they have, you know, high implied skew. You know, and it's a, we just found it very interesting and, and certainly worthwhile um, as a predictor. And, and is, is there any sort of um, preference between the absolute or, or relative spreads? Is it, is it one that, you to prefer or works better or is it in combination? Uh, with individual stocks, what we found is that, uh, and this is just our own findings, momentum is, you know, tends to be, tends to be effective, but somewhat time varying in terms of its effectiveness. You know, it can go through, you know, sort of, you know, good and bad spells. So for, I gave you the example of a 2009, whereas, you know, momentum is doing incredibly well this year as an example. So it can have, you know, re- it can be really hot or really cold, so to speak. And so this seemed to be a more consistent predictor and also um, a more um, less noisy predictor of, of the cross section of stock returns. So if you use it to try to explain stock returns, so to speak, if you compare it to other factors or multi-factor model, it tended to be more efficient. And if we looked at sort of a individual putting to work the momentum stuff, that's one thing. This seems like this would be a really challenging way to kind of find the data and parse it and sort. I mean, are there any commercially available sources of data for this options uh, sort of stuff? Or do you got to have a, a Bloomy and or something pretty sophisticated to, to sift through this? Yeah, I mean, there's a wide variety of sources. I mean, you know, you can use, uh, you know, use LiveVol, um, I believe high volatility, you know, there, it is difficult to obtain. I mean, to be able to do this for, you know, to take a universe of, you know, thousands of stocks is, is, is pretty complicated and time consuming. You certainly have to have a lot of computational horsepower. So, you know, we view that as a positive thing because it kind of creates a bit of a barrier to entry. So, but it's, you know, certainly there is data out there. Uh, it's an area that I don't know that much about. I just spent a month long project working with options data only to find out that the CBOE published <laughs> put some indices that would would work for what we were doing. I, I think I lost a month of my life to that. So I'm 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 a little grumpy about options data currently because it's it's an order of magnitude more complicated than just futzing around with just pure equities. And now a word from our sponsor. Today's podcast is sponsored by FreshBooks, the best cloud-based small business accounting software. Look, I've never taken an accounting class in my life and found FreshBooks easy to navigate within the first 30 seconds. Here's an example. Say you're racing against the clock to wrap up three projects, prepping for a meeting late in the afternoon, all while trying to tackle a mountain of paperwork. Welcome to life as a freelancer. Challenging? Yep. But our friends at FreshBooks believe the rewards are so worth it. 
Look, the working world has changed. With the growth of the internet, there's never been more opportunities for the self-employed. To meet this need, FreshBooks is excited to announce the launch of an all-new version of their cloud accounting software. It's been redesigned from the ground up, custom built for exactly the way you work. Get ready for the simplest way to be more productive, organized, and most importantly, get paid quickly. The all-new FreshBooks is not only ridiculously easy to use, it's also packed full of powerful features, such as Create and send professional-looking invoices in less than 30 seconds. Set up online payments with just a couple of clicks and get paid up to four days faster. See when your client has seen your invoice and put an end to all the guessing games. FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to my listeners. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com forward slash meb and enter the Meb Faber Show in the How'd You Hear About Us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com forward slash meb. And now back to the show. We only have you so long. I wanted to still squeeze in a couple more questions. We have a lot of listeners that are kind of at, near, or in retirement. You guys wrote another white paper called The Importance of Managing Risk in Retirement. You discuss a model for quantifying the risk of financial ruin, uh, which I think is pretty important, but includes inputs of life expectancy, expected withdrawal rates, expected portfolio return, and expected portfolio volatility. Uh, could you walk us through the model a little bit, how retirees should be thinking about their investment horizon and risk management in general? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, it's a, uh, it can be a you know, very nuanced area, but I mean, I think the, the, the general findings are, and this is, you know, as I said at the beginning of the call, I mean, it's just mathematically true. You know, volatility is really the, you know, when it comes to withdrawing money, I mean, the math is very different. When you're, when you're contributing to your portfolio in the accumulation phase, you get to dollar cost average and, and, and essentially benefit to some degree from the, the volatility of, uh, you know, of, of the stock market. And so, you know, you'll, you'll buy more when, when stocks are low and you'll buy less when stocks are high. You know, when you're withdrawing, you know, you face kind of the opposite problem. And, you know, vol- volatility when you're withdrawing is, is the enemy, uh, you know, of, uh, of your returns. And so, you know, when you have a nest egg, you're trying to maximize your probability that you don't run out or, or you're trying to maximize the length of time that it will last. And so when you have volatility, you, you can't withdraw as much. And so, for example, 100% stock allocation, you know, you can't, you can't withdraw you know, if you're expected to earn 8%, you can't withdraw 6 or 7 or 8% because the stock market will give you widely different returns from year to year, you know. Um, and so, but if you had a strategy that produced a very reliable, you know, 5 or 6 or 7%, you know, you could withdraw a large, larger fraction of it. And so it's mathematically true. And just a, a simple example, real-life example, I mean, if you're um, – you know, a tenured professor and you earn a certain amount every single year, you can spend a lot more of your money, you know, reliably and, and spend it almost to the, to the, you know, exactly matching what you're earning each month. But if you're an entrepreneur, you always have to, you know, save a lot of money in cash because your income is substantially variable. And so the same thing applies. And so when you manage risk, you're managing that volatility. And so if you can manage that volatility, um, without substantially detracting from returns, you can uh, substantially increase your sustainable withdrawal rate, and you can also substantially increase the probability that you won't run out of money, or inversely, the probability of success. It's interesting. You see a lot of research from <clears throat> some of the big shops that, that, that talk a lot about fundamentals. Do any sort of macro fundamental level inputs make your way into the portfolios? Or for the most part, are you guys, you know, kind of te- technically focused on the, uh, on the portfolio management? Well, in terms of the fundamentals, what, what, what do you mean by that? Are you, are you talking about... Uh, so like valuations, you know, so because I was thinking about retirement, I was thinking about the challenges. You've seen so many studies by GMO and AQR where they, they look at the 60-40 portfolio and they say, this is one of the lowest expected returns 
for this portfolio in the last century. They say U.S. stocks are expensive, uh, bonds are yielding to and change. So this historical 8% return or whatever that investors are used to and factor into many of the retirement calculations may be, you know, a, a very high expectation. Is it, I, mean, I was just curious, I because I didn't know, I didn't think it did, but any sort of valuation or other sort of macro-based fundamentals make their way in the portfolios or is it pretty much mostly price-based? Well, the strategic a- uh, allocations incorporate, you know, much of that information, you know, just, just notionally. I mean, you know, we, we, we pretty much can, can say definitively that, that bond returns are not going to be um, as high over the next 10 years as they were over the past 10 years. Um, so you need to have more equity exposure. And so, you know, I think the, the advantage of, you know, knowing that and knowing that you can, to some extent, manage risk uh, or you can manage certain types of risks, you know, using, you know, momentum and trends is that you can increase your equity allocation, you know, at the, in, at the same level of volatility. And so by increasing your, your equity allocation, you know, which tends to have a higher expected return, you know, you're, you're likely to do better than a conventional portfolio that would be heavily weighted in bonds. And so 60, 40 is, you know, if, if 40% is, is earning, you know, one or 2%, then that's a substantial, drag on returns. So if you can increase that to, for example, 80%, uh, it's a 20% fixed income and 80% equities or, or even more, you know, then you can enhance your returns. So we've held you for quite a while. I've got a couple other kind of quick questions and then we'll start to wind down. What do you, what are you guys thinking about today? Any sort of research you're working on or any sort of puzzles in your brain that you think are particularly interesting or exciting right now? Uh, anything in general that y'all are, uh, putting pencil to paper on and, and, and studying up in Canada? Anything, uh, come to mind? Yeah. I mean, we're looking at a wide variety of things. Um, you know, I think, I think right now, well, we, we, ha- what we have done. Um, is we're taking a look at, you know, how to, how to decide which, you know, which factors might be in favor. So sort of a tactical, uh, factor allocation. And so, you know, we've been, we've been, you know, poking around at that. I know a lot of people have said it can't be done, but, you know, we've, we found some promising research in that area. You know, we've also looked a lot, you know, very interested in, um, you know, strategies that can help you address, uh, tail risk. I know that. Um, you know, you've, you've obviously, uh, launched something that, that addresses that. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it, it's a very important area. And so we're, we're doing some research, uh, in that area. Um, you know, just taking a look at different ways to, you know, to manage that tail risk because it's a nice complement to the risk management of a, uh, momentum or trend approach, you know, which can protect you against secular moves, but it doesn't protect you against shocks. And so, you know, those are some of the things that we're poking around at. Cool. I like all those. We've, it's been one of the reasons I asked, it's been a little bit of a slow summer here and I'm, I'm, I'm a little brain dead on new ideas. The last one we were working on was a bunch of tax optimization white paper, which is, is about as boring as you can get. So we, we, we love thinking of those ideas. The tail risk obviously is, is one close to the heart, but keep us updated. We'll have to have you back on the podcast when you, when you think of, um, some more. On a personal level, or I guess this could be professional as well. What's what's the most memorable trade that comes to mind? And this could, or it could be an investment, and it can be good or it can be bad. But thinking back, kind of, what's what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the most memorable investment of your career? Uh, mine personally. <laughs> And give me personally or work. I mean, mine. I've talked a lot about was blowing up a biotech equity straddle in the early 2000s that cost me like my entire portfolio is a fun story where I had the set up where the volatility expanded into the expiration. And so the, the position was already in the money. And so a reasonable person probably would have taken some chips off the table, but I was very unreasonable in my early 20s. And then the drug got approved. So the the one side of the options was, um, again, in the money. And so the whole reason for the trade was done. And I uh, should have closed the position because it made money. And then about a day or two later, I said, maybe I'll give it a day or two to see if we can squeeze out a little extra extra profit. And of course, the trade went right back down to 
the strike price because the company pre-announced earning earnings for no particular reason and essentially lost my entire account and spent the next year eating mustard sandwiches. But <laughs> that's just my example. Um, so, yeah, but but it's the first thing that always comes to mind for me. Is there anything yeah, in particular? I mean, there, that, there, uh, there are there are a couple a couple from this year. I mean, one one of which was um, I'm not sure if you if you guys are aware. I mean, I see it a lot in the press about the Canadian uh, real estate market being. Uh, overvalued here. Yeah, you guys just had Pitbull and uh, Tony Robbins in uh, in yeah. Toronto pump, <laughs> pumping the real estate. They may have they may have hit the exact top. I think it's down a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I think it's I think it's you know it's, it's it still seems to be uh, to be going up, but I mean, I think it's 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 certainly uh, certainly a frothy area. I mean, I'm, I'm looking out my window right now at about 20 different construction projects. <laughs> But uh, but you know we I I, I bought uh, I was I was lucky enough I, I bought puts on uh, Home Capital Group, you know just before it collapsed and it you know turned out to be uh, it was like a month before it collapsed and uh, I managed to get out of most of it when it was when it was quite low and held on to some of it after Warren Buffett uh, announced that he was buying back into it. But uh, but yeah I mean I I think I bought the 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 options for I, I think it was, was two dollars and sixty cents and then they went up to. I think as high as twenty dollars, and I think that 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 was a it was a pretty memorable trade because it was just yeah you know, I think the based on the timing of it it was kind of eyeballing you know the chart because I didn't have anything specific you know I didn't have any quant tools to use specifically on that um, but I you know I knew fundamentally I knew that there was you know some issues going on there and so you know, it was it was a memorable trade I mean I just literally looked at my phone one morning and all of a sudden it was down uh, sixty or seventy percent one. <laughs> In one day, so that was good, and I think I think the other one was uh, was was Bitcoin. Um, I I, just, I couldn't believe um, I, I bought it through Grayscale uh, GBTC, which is a Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust, and I mean I just I I I bought into it around I think it was 130, and it just it kept on going up, and I I, I kept on selling as as it was going up. And it went up eventually to I think it was maybe five hundred and sixty or five hundred and sixty five dollars intraday. It was crazy. I mean, but I you know, I didn't sell at the top. I mean I literally sold you know, selling into the frenzy because I, I guess my rationale was is that, you know, when things go parabolic it's hard to use a, a trend approach on things unless you're using a really, really short term trend. So I was selling into strength, but I I didn't end up getting uh, anywhere near I guess where it went up to, but uh, it's been a, it was a pretty crazy ride. The, the cryptocurrencies has been a lot of fun. I, I think we'll we'll have to do a few more episodes on it in the future. I um, uh, it's it's a pleasant distraction for me. I've never owned any, never traded any, despite the fact that we've had a Bitcoin payment option on the on the idea farm for like five years. No one's ever sent us any Bitcoin, so we got a bottle of tequila though. Which Jeff, by the way, podcast listeners, I want you to appreciate this. Jeff absconded home with a bottle of tequila. We never saw it again. Just kind of whisked it away. So uh, if you if you send any in, you're gonna have to address it to me because Jeff will Jeff will just take it home. Uh, we were gonna have margaritas in the office, and we went fishing around the tequila. Could never find it. What's kind of like your uh, takeaway advice for listeners? You know, we have uh, individuals listening to this podcast. You've, you've kind of presented a lot of really interesting ideas. You know, any sort of just last piece of advice, uh, practical advice for uh, investors on the podcast? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, 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 the practical advice is, is, you know, you have to sit down and carefully, you know, think through what you're trying to accomplish you know, and, and, and try to try to blend a mix of, you know, dynamic and passive strategies or, or even segregate accounts, you know, have something that you're going to, you know, not pay attention to. So that could be your passive portfolio and, you know, and, and have, you know, the portion of your portfolio that might be significant to you that you don't want to have a lot of risk. You know, you can use a more dynamic approach. You know, and, and lastly, you should have a portfolio that you use for special situations that, you know, you, you may identify on a discretionary basis. You know, so you can sort of satisfy your your urge to gamble, so to speak, if you want to, you know, buy certain special situations, whether it's you know options or exotic asset classes. And so I think when you have a, have those three accounts, it makes it a lot easier to invest sustainably. Otherwise, you tend to commingle everything together. You know, if you're doing one, then you'll increase the allocation to that. If 
you know, you, you need to have sort of a coherent strategy, but it needs to be segregated from a mental standpoint, and you need to be very disciplined and, and sticking with that to be successful over time. Well, that, that's a that's an interesting takeaway because we we talked to, to podcast listeners at the end of the year, beginning of this year, and said, "All right, wipe the slate clean. Start with what we call the zero budget portfolio." and write down your investment plan. And I challenge our listeners to do it. I'm guessing about 0.1% ever did, but but said the systematic approach for a lot of uh, the main portfolio is, is really point and exercise, but um, very few fall with it. So which is probably going back to William Bernstein's 99% of people shouldn't be doing it comment, because it's a it's a rather simple formula, but a very difficult prescription. Um, David, it's been a blast. Where can our listeners follow your writings uh, and, and more, if they, more information on the fund offerings if they want to find out more? Uh, sure, yeah. They can go to uh, uh, B- bsam.com, uh, uh, which is Blue Sky Asset Management, and they can also go to quantexfunds.com um, to learn more about the funds. And your writing will appear on both. You still do the blog anymore? I used to love your blog. Is it migrated mostly to the the two websites? I think no. I, I haven't really been uh, blogging too much. I've been uh, quite quite busy, I guess, with uh, operational items and and other types of things. But I mean, I think I think eventually I'll you know maybe uh, write down a few uh, different types of things. And in, in most of your writing in the meantime, will it show up on Blue Sky, Quantex, somewhere in the ether? Probably, probably show up on uh, Blue Sky. Awesome. David, it's been a blast. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Yeah, thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks for having me. Listeners, thanks for your time uh, listening in today. We welcome feedback, questions for the mailbag. Shoot them over to Jeff at feedback at com. As a reminder, you can always find the show notes. Uh, we'll put in some of those charts we talked about today and other episodes at mebfavor.com forward slash podcast. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, and if you're enjoying it, please leave a review. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Today's podcast is sponsored by Founders Card. I usually don't spring for paid membership programs, but this one is a little different. The offering is targeted to entrepreneurs and business owners, and the card enables premier benefits from leading airlines, hotels, lifestyle brands, and business services. A few of my favorite benefits include free access to MailChimp Pro, Dashlane Premium, and TripIt Pro. You can even get big discounts to services I love like Silvercar, 99designs, Apple, and AT&T. My favorite, though, are the travel benefits where you get an automatic status such as Hilton Honors Gold, American Airlines Platinum, and Virgin America Gold. And while I often use the great app Hotel Tonight for travel, the Founders Card discounts can be massive, too. If you go to founderscard.com forward slash meb, Podcast listeners can sign up for the discounted $395 a year with no initiation fee, and that's a saving from the normal cost of around $600 per year. Again, that's founderscard.com forward slash MEB.